Hey Firecrackers, it's Naomi and welcome to the Firecracker Department. Happy June! Happy warm weather for most of us. Happy noises of summer, can you hear? I've got boats and kids jumping off docks and lawnmowers and mosquitoes and all the best and the worst sounds of summer. Gosh, I love June so much. And happy Pride! Happy Pride Month, everybody! You know, here at Firecrack Department, we, of course, of course, celebrate queer pride all year round. All year round. But June, it just gives us a little, you know, a little boost to just celebrate even louder. And uh, not just with rainbow graphics, which I know I love. And of course, thanks to our very own Vicki Breyer, we also have amazing graphics in the firecracker department. But it's not just about the illustrations, it's about keeping these principles of inclusivity in perspective at all times. Of course, not just 30 days of rainbow stickers and social media banners, but all, all the time. I have to say, I remember working in Halifax. This is one of my favorite pride memories. All of us, the cast and some of the crew, went and found like a little bar area and it was packed, it was packed. If, if you've ever been to Pride in Halifax, it's just an extraordinary celebration on Spring Garden there. And we'd found this little bar and I'd smuggled my dog in and we sat there and watched this parade go by. And yeah, it was colorful. And yeah, there was Justin Trudeau and that made me feel great. And then there was this kid, he had like shocking red hair. His face had beautiful makeup on it. He was wearing this like decal cool t-shirt and like sparkly shorts and, and uh, really neat socks. And he just looked fantastic. And he was like leaping like a beautiful elk or a deer leaping around the parade. I don't even know if he was part of the parade. I didn't care because I just loved it so much. It was so full of joy and love. And I remember watching that going, yes, 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 more of this. Anything I can do to celebrate that kind of love and celebration. I mean, the joy that I saw on his face was extraordinary. And I was like, yes, I want that everywhere. And so as you know, Firecracker Department, that's our jam. We want to make people feel as welcome as possible, no matter what community you're in. We want to make y'all feel so comfortable so that you can feel like you can express yourself, you can take creative action in whatever area you want. And let me just say this, if ever you see anything in Firecracker Department land that is a bit off or weird, or we're missing the mark in some form, whether it's us or our community members, please reach out to me. Reach out to me personally and just be like, hey Sneakers, here's a heads up. Someone's not using the right pronouns or someone's not being as inclusive as we could be. We all need nudges and we're all human, so we're gonna make mistakes and we're gonna keep trying. But I'm so proud of the Firecracker core team and the community for doing the work that we're doing. And big, big shout out to our LGBTQ plus core members. I've got my hands around the microphone and I'm hugging you. I'm hugging you so hard. I am so, so grateful that you're not only in this world, you're in my world, because I'll tell you something, way better, way, way better with you in it. And that goes for all of you, all of you listening to this. I am so, so glad that we are as colorful of a community as we are. And uh, it's way better because you're here. So happy Pride Month. Share your pride pictures with me, would you? Hashtag Firecracker Pride. Let me know how you're celebrating. Maybe you're making some art. I would love to celebrate you and as always our LGBTQ plus members. We love you. Now I've got my hands above my head like I'm riding a roller coaster. Whee! Yes! We love you! Okay, on with our shout outs. Here's a little shout out from our very own Sydney Nielsen. Hey everybody, uh, Sydney Nielsen here. I am the head of podcast post-production and communications at Firecracker Department, which includes social media, the newsletter, a little bit of everything in between. Uh, my Firecracker shout out today is to gender non-conforming writer and performance artist, Alok Vadmenin. Now, my queer ass thought that everyone knew who Alok was, um, but after bringing them up recently with a few different people, I realized that is definitely not the case. So if you're not familiar, I super suggest reading their book, Beyond the Gender Binary, and following them on social media at A-L-O-K-V-M-E-N-O-N. -O -O their work to degender fashion and fight transphobia with facts, as well as humanity and patience, inspires me every single day. <laughs> uh, here's one brief quote that I cannot love enough. 
What I like about colors is that when you mix them together, they become greater than the sum of their parts, something different altogether. No one goes around asking, but are you really more blue or more green? Teal is not blue-green, it is teal. Now that was from a Lokes Beyond the Gender Binary, which is such a concisely written look into the malleability of gender and their Instagram and mailing list have such incredibly well-sourced and just beautiful reports on black trans leaders in history, women with mustaches, and so much more. Uh, and all of that is again, A-L-O-K-V-M-E-N-O-N dot com. And that's my firecracker shout out. Bye. Thanks, Sid. Oh boy, I love these shout outs. I love these shout outs so much. And I know you do too. I, I just love the opportunity to share some love. So if you know somebody that's in your world that you think, oh, I'd love to give them an extra little bit of uh, light on what they're doing, uh, extra spark to their sparkler, whatever you like, please send it as a voice memo to firecrackerdepartment at gmail.com. Don't forget to include your name, your firecracker's name, why they're so fantastic, and a couple of handles so we can follow them along. These shadows just make my day. Okay, now our guest on the show this week is actor, filmmaker, musician, and executive producer Kelly McCormack. And, okay, this is easily one of my favorite talks I've ever had in my life. I just have to say, she's just such a real, real treat. And uh, not only is Kelly just a beautiful artist to their core, but an absolute star with her candor and authenticity. And I mean, that's just a couple reasons why it was just such a pleasure to chat with them. I feel like these kind of conversations come along at the time that I need them. I just so need to talk about art and why we do it and why we're passionate about it. And I can't think of a better person than Kelly to sit down and get super nerdy about why we love our art. Now currently Kelly is gearing up to shoot the Amazon Studio TV reimagining of the 1992 classic A League of Their Own, starring alongside Abby Jacobson from Broad City, Darcy Carden, not a girl, not a robot, from The Good Place, and Shantae Adams, star of Roxanne, Roxanne. I am so jazzed for this, I mean I love that movie to bits, and then knowing that Kelly's in on the remake, I mean mwah, you know? It's one of those beautiful, magical moments. Kelly recently starred in the firecracker-filled hit Netflix series, Ginny and Georgia, and Kelly's latest feature film, Sugar Daddy, which is, I have to tell you, breathtakingly gorgeous. Again, artistic. It's like this beautiful feature film with a clear story, clear point of view, and beautiful images and music. And yeah, it's just gorgeous all around. Uh, the film also, BTW, was written and produced by Kelly. Sugar Daddy explores the way in which young women are trained to perform femininity and was also the opening night film for the Whistler Film Festival and at the Canadian Film Festival. It won Best Feature with Kelly winning Best Performance. They star alongside the one and only Colm Fiore who won a Canadian Screen Award for his performance. And oh my gosh, the hits just keep coming. The original music for the film was written by the artist Foxtrot, also known as Marie-Hélène El Delorme, and performed by Kelly herself. And this past May, the song won Best Original Song at the Canadian Screen Awards. Come on! Kelly started their career in classical music and then theatre before moving into filmmaking, and we talk all about this. I think it's so interesting to hear folks on these episodes where they start with one idea of what they want to create, and then you see them evolving to this other creator. Has that happened to you? Is that happening to you? I think it's really exciting to watch. Because you're sort of like building your craft your art tool belt you know you never sort of throw away these other crafts you just sort of add them to your tool belt kelly spent many years in experimental theater in new york as a member of sigourney weaver and jim simpson's the flea theater back company and under the visionary direction of four-time tony nominated liz suedos she just does it all as a writer as a filmmaker their work has won numerous best screenplay awards internationally and just you know we're over here Firecracker department just waving, going, keep going, Kelly! We love ya! Kelly will also star in the upcoming second season of Departure on NBC slash Global TV and will return as the trash talk and hockey player Betty Ann on the hit series Letter Kenny on Hulu and Crave TV. And alongside fellow Firecracker and fantastic friends, <laughs> yeah, I did that, Jess Salguero, who also appears in Kelly's film Sugar Daddy. I tell you, there are some wicked firecracker crossovers and I love it. It makes my heart just sing. 
Some of Kelly's other recent credits include the Canadian Screen Award nominated performance as androgynous scientist Zeth on the sci-fi space network show Killjoys and a role in Paul Feig's A Simple Favor starring Blake Lively, Anna Kendrick and Linda Cardellini. Plus Carter on NBC with fellow firecracker Sydney Hartsong Poitier and yours truly, you can catch us all. In fact, we were all on the same episode. We were filming in this curling rink and uh, it was pretty fun. I mean, part of the fun is just hanging out with Kelly. Who's kidding who? Kelly was there, Jess was there, Christian Broom was there, uh, Matt Barham, my husband was there. It was a good time. Jerry O'Connell was there, Sydney Hartsong Poitier was there. Everybody was there and there were snacks, so it was a pretty good time. She is also on Special Correspondence on Netflix, The Expanse on Sci-Fi or Amazon, and Crawford on Comedy Central and CBC, as well as the free CBC Gem app. I'm really excited, can you tell? I think I'm talking really fast because there's a lot of credits to go over right now and I don't care, I wanted to squeeze them all in to let you know what a firecracker Kelly is and I'm excited to share this conversation with you. She filled my heart this conversation and you know what, it filled my like creative tank. You ever feel that as an artist when you're like, oh my creative tank is just empty. And then you go and see a show, you hear some music, you see a piece of art and it starts to fill the tank up. This is what this conversation did for me. Without further ado, I know you're gonna get as inspired as I was talking to Kelly. So here is Kelly McCormack. Let's get started. Kelly McCormack. Hi. My Hi. friend. Hi, Hi, buddy. Oh, this is the best. I know. I was like, <laughs> I literally have had already the morning where you wake up and you have so many emails and so much bullshit to deal with that like you you're seven emails in and you're like, I have heck. I haven't even had coffee yet. Yeah. I haven't showered. Like, I have like for the first time in my life, I have like a morning routine, like a yeah. like that, wake up, read for an hour, write for two, like work out a bit because my anxiety has been just off yes. the charts. Me too. And, um, and, to, and even like my social anxiety and my talking like this, like I'm, I'm very happy to, but I was like, I was like, I just need to like, because I've been so alone for so long mm-hmm. that it, like you have to work up to it. How do you, so how do you navigate that anxiety, that level of isolation with also this passion for creating? Uh, well, that's a good question. I, I have, I think what I'm really proud of that I, that I really has only solidified in the last couple of years is I've started to be able to visualize and, um, put words to the, the conditions that I need to be creative. Like I think I know how to advocate for myself in a way that I didn't a couple of years ago. And a lot of that creative space is, is, is comes from solitude and silence and, and choosing time alone and carving out travel for myself and um, experimentation and, and like little sabbaticals where I kind of move around the world and, and, and do that. And I've stopped sort of, you know, there's a point in your career where you're like, maybe this will happen or maybe this will happen and maybe my brain will do this. I, I've now seen patterns where I'm like, for me to be creative, I need these extreme periods of um, intense cabin fever work. And then I need to like travel for a month and do nothing and just read and do that. And then I need to do like, it's sort of like a combination of, I am a workaholic. So it, 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 but I, I, but I feel like I, I know the, the currency of it. Like I know what the freak, I know what the, um, what, what it needs to look like. And it doesn't always look like me sitting in front of a computer and, you know, banging on a million emails and, and just staying up till 4 a.m. Um, writing scripts and da, 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 da. Um, it used to be that. And I used to not sleep. And then I read this book, Why We Sleep. Um, and I started sleeping, which is a new thing. <laughs> Cause I used to sleep like, I used famously, like people could call me at four in the morning. I'd be like, what's up? Like, I just would go to bed at four in the morning. I slept for four hours maybe. And I took a lot of pride in that. And I didn't realize I took a lot of pride in that until I started transitioning and realized transitioning into sleeping. I started transitioning to sleeping and realized that there was a lot of my identity tied in this sort of like, like career at all costs, personal life, not important. yeah. So yeah, not a lot of that, but I, I'm still a workaholic. I just think that the tapestry and the hypothesis of how I can work and, and what I need, it's like, a, it's like, I need to go into a vice period of like tight woundness. And then I need to unwind it in the ephemeral 
nature-based, travel-based way. So that's a great image. It's not always possible though. Like, I mean, didn't you have a doctor that, that uh, like challenged you or wrote you a prescription for leaving the country and taking a break? <laughs> because I think sometimes like what you've just described, like, I think that's a really healthy place to be. I don't think, I think that's a learned approach, right? Like there's a time where you find yourself like, why am I so uh, nauseous? Why am I not sleeping well? And that's the young version of a workaholic. The older version is like, fine, I got to shut down before it gets more serious. Yeah. Though I would say like, unfortunately, I'm not at a place where like people, at, like my therapist once asked me, um, like, what do you do for me time? What do you do for you time? Me time. And I was like, what are you talking about? It's like, uh-huh. <laughs> she was yeah. like, what do you this do? Is. We are um, living in the me time. What do you do? for yourself that has nothing to do with your career that is just for your own enjoyment and I was like I was like what are you talking about Everything keep talking I, every I'm thing I do so um yeah. and I don't have like a work-life balance like this balance idea is not a thing so it's a false it's sort of like a, a, a false revelation where I'm like because at the end of the day if I travel somewhere it's because I'm researching something and I'm that. and if I'm like and I can't justify, I, know, right. I can't take a holiday. I'm not able to be like, okay, I'm just going to turn off everything, not look, look, not look at my emails, not touch writing, whatever. But I've sort of just come to terms with that because like, there is nothing, that is what brings me the most joy is like waking up, reading, writing for a couple hours, you know, wandering in the woods, putting on music, visualizing stuff that I want to do. Mm -hmm. and, but yeah. that makes sense as a diversion, like you're still recharging. I just think that we're in a, in a place where we're so passionate about what we're creating that when opportunities come in that are in no. line with those passions, you can't turn them down. Or how do you do that? Because like, let's say you're tapped out and you're like, no, no, I'm, this is the time I need to regroup. And somebody goes, yes. Yeah. Or would you like to be in this film? You're going <laughs> to be like, um, regroup for another day. Yeah. I guess. I'm getting way better at saying no to stuff, which has been also exciting, but I need the aid of like my entire yeah. team, like my mat, my manager, my agent. Like I um, recently, we were trying to figure out if I could like fly back to Toronto to shoot another episode of Letter Kenny, and it was like obviously I want to do it because I love that show and I love being on that show. But it came to the point where I was like, wait, this is a pandemic. I'm da -da -da -da. like, and it just became. But that, mm -hmm. that I just come from a place of like, if there's a will, there's a way and I can do everything. I can do everything if I need to it, right. I can absolutely do it. And so my, my agent, yeah, all these things, like, yeah, all just of those things. Just wake up an so hour earlier, right? My agent literally had to yes. talk me off the ledge. And he was like, do you need me to talk to your mother? Cause I feel, I feel like her and I are aligned. And I was like, my mom's like, I don't think this is a good idea. My agent's like, I don't think this is a good idea. But of course, you know, only because there's a pandemic. If this was not a pandemic, I would be like, goodbye. Um, I'll fly anywhere for one day of shooting, no matter what. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a whole, that was a whole thing. But uh, uh, yes, I did. One time I was desperately ill with like a lung infection for like many, many months. And then my doctor basically said, he was like, we tried everything. We tried all these prescriptions. I was like hacking up just the most like body horror crap in the shower and like looking at it being like, yeah. who am I? Yeah. I am a disgusting amorphous What's going on? Yeah. molecule of horror. It was just like the oh. stuff that was coming out of my body was. Yeah, it's a pretty clear sign. Like if you're, <laughs> like if you're in the shower and your insides are leaving to your yeah. outside. And just, that's but, a sign. Yeah, and the color was like, oh, I didn't know that color was in my body. Oh, Thank God. God. It was awful. So um, my doctor had oh, said God. something like, um, you yeah. know, uh, you just might need, you, maybe you just need like a warmer climate because it was January. And I was so angry. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm not some sort of like 16th century poet. Yeah. Yeah. So then I was like, I was steaming up my bathroom and calling it Italy and hacking up, hacking up this like disgusting <laughs> mucus and being like, this is my greatest work. And then from the bathroom, I'm not kidding you from the bathroom yeah. floor. I was like, you know what? Why, why can't I be a 16th century poet from the English gentry who can afford to go to Italy and like deal with their malaise and artistic, you know, sickness and get over malaria and eventually die in Italy. So from my phone, literally on the, on the bathroom, I booked a flight to Rome. 
And I called my doctor oh my and I was like, I need travel insurance. I need puffers. I need things. And he was like, all right. And I went there for a month and did a, um, a, a literary walking tour of all the well I got better which was great but I also did a literary walking tour because I can't just go somewhere to get better <laughs> I did a literary walking no, tour on I all know. the famous poets you know like Shelley Byron Keats and 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 um, Death in Venice and all these like these this idea Amazing. that male artists from privileged white male artists from England from like the English gentry from like you know who are already barons and noblemen go to Italy to get over tuberculosis or their malaise or their artistic confusion. And, and, and at one point, you know, write mm -hmm. their greatest work and die on a beach or discover that the only um, beautiful thing on earth or the single, the, the singularly most beautiful thing on earth is like a virgin woman or like an underage boy or something. And so I wanted to kind of unpack how like the sexism of our understanding of auteurism and I just dressed up like Death in Venice and and Keats and Shelley and I recreate I went to all the places they died and so instead of being like you know because all these guys were like 20 year old mm -hmm. twerps like they were all like 21 26 27 and we and we venerate them we 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 th think of them as like the the like romantic poets and these and these um, signifiers and shepherds of what real art is. And yet each one of them let like the, the female wreckage that they left getting to Italy, like the amount of women they impregnated who died of malaria and women who jumped off bridges was, so I was sort of trying to embody this stereotype, embody this idea of like the, the privileged white male mm -hmm. becoming better through like being around the beacon of art, the, the very like citadel of art. And, and sort of just say, and, and unpack how much, how they did that at the cost of so many women and, and how we don't know these women's names, but we know that Shelley died on the beach gripping Keats's poem. And they're all like 20, like who gives a fuck about what they, I mean, they're great poems, yeah. but. <laughs> but do you think that was your low point as far as health goes? Like, do you feel like that was the biggest turning point of going, no, I got to keep better on top of this kind of stuff? Oh. Yes, I was so ill and going on a holiday to get better, which I, which also resulted in me doing an incredible amount of work, <laughs> um, was, was pretty great. I mean, it was, a uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very much like a escape hatch in terms of health and, and like, I, I am pretty good. I'm pretty mobile. Like if I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to go, I'm going to go to Berlin for a month and I'll just mm -hmm. get on a flight and do it. Or I'll, I'm living in you know, this in the woods right now. And I'll, I'll live here for a bit. I don't, I'm so nomadic that it's just, uh, but had, that was the sickest I've ever been. And then now like, um, yeah. you know, now I'm just making, trying not to get COVID and trying to get my vaccine and all that stuff. So, but yeah, that, that was like the yeah. longest holiday yeah. I've ever taken. Well, I mean, it's because I have to say, like, I know you and I spoke about this quote unquote holiday but um and what your and what your process was was like learning about these poets and writers and I feel like some people like immerse themselves into that kind of thing um and it's not natural does that make sense like they kind of go into the going oh you know it'd be really romantic is if I did this but I feel like you do it and it's like an actuality of who you are like I don't think there's an over amount of like uh, not forethought, but just like you're not trying to live up to a, a, an image or a vision of somebody else. You're like, no, this is just something that's within me that I know I have to pursue. Oh man, that's like the best compliment. <laughs> um, I mean, I I feel that. I mean, I come like you. I come from theater and performance art, and I started off in opera, and musical theater, and then I rejected it and moved to New York and was like dumping ink on my naked body, like in, embodying a tree in like a you know, experimental opera about a feral child in Nuremberg, stuff like that, where I, I don't see, yeah. I yeah. mean, this is such a, I, I, I honestly hate hearing actors and artists talk like this, but I, I don't know how else to talk about it, but there's not much difference between who I am and, and, and the art that I do. Like if I could, if I could pay bills just doing theater and just doing right. performance art and, um, you know, doing site specific theater where in various places in the world that make no sense to anyone <laughs> that I would, that would be what I'd mm -hmm. want to do. And um, I think there's a, a very permeable line for me 
between what I'm writing, how I'm dressing, what music I'm listening to, how I'm like all that stuff. So embodying things like I was just, uh, I was just talking to my professor because I sort of, I also went back to school this year and was doing that because I can't just take a year off. <laughs> What did you go back to school for? Uh, well, I, I've sort of been pivoting my master's from literature to gender studies. So oh. I sort of was like, but I haven't been able to go back to UBC for so many years because I've been living everywhere yeah. but Vancouver. And then, so I sort of took the pandemic as an, as an opportunity to be like, oh, I guess so I can do this stuff online now. So I've been trying to pivot my field of study and by taking a bunch of classes in anthropology and stuff. So. But I was talking about talking with my professor about other grad programs in the UK. And I was like, I was like, I want to go to university. I want to go to grad school again, but I want to, I want to in like embody a character going to grad. I don't, it was just this like whole yeah. thing. This and sounds so Kelly McCormick to me. Like, <laughs> it sounds like nobody else would say this kind of thing other than you. So keep going. I, I have all the time for this. I was like, I need like a choose your own adventure program where I can like, literally topple and investigate the foundations and institutions of patriarchy within the university system by embodying the blah, blah, blah. and it, it makes no sense it makes no sense to anyone it, barely me but um uh that's sort of like where my brain is headed but uh so i'm happy we're talking about sick and exile because which was the name of my little literary tour because um i was literally talking about this like yesterday trying to tr trying to explain to my the academic side of my career mm -hmm. you know how to make my art side and my academic side sort of like work together. Mm -hmm. And luckily I feel like I'm in a place in my life where, and I'm sure, you know, we could talk about this for hours, but like where I can actually like demand these things and be like, no, this is what I need to do mm -hmm. as opposed to ask for permission. It's an interesting thing though, hearing you talk about your academia side of yourself and versus your artistic, because one of the things I find really challenging about art is the, is the disconnection between heart and mind. And so yeah. you studying takes you into a really cerebral place. And then you have to sort of put that on a shelf and close the cupboard and get back to your heart. Do you find that process with, within mm. your, your artistic uh, journey? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm sure you, you definitely experience this where it's like, you go through these periods of mass production where you're like, I'm producing this, I'm producing this one woman show. I'm, I'm writing on this web series. I'm doing an interview with this. I'm doing this stand up. I'm doing this and you're producing and you're producing and you're producing and you're taking all your, everything you know about yourself subconsciously, consciously is all, all the well you're like filling up the, the well is being, uh, this is a terrible metaphor. They're pulling the, the water from the well that you've sort of cultivated from how many years of this chapter of your life is now being generated, mm -hmm. right? Like the things you're interested in this show, all of these things. I go through these periods of mass production where I'm like, I'm writing this book and I'm writing this film and I'm writing this play and I'm da da da. And then I, I feel like I need a period of not production, yeah. but like research. And I, I need to absorb stuff. When I was in university last, you know, much younger, you, you're, you're kind of like, I'm ready. I was so ready to produce. I was so ready yeah. to be like, no, I don't, I don't want this. I want to put it out there and I want to make stuff. And so it's interesting to come back to academia and be like at a, in a period where I'm like, I'm exhausted. I need, I've exhausted my inner well and I need to absorb and, and, and read different things. And, you know, and it, it's just, it's the same thing where you're like the difference between reading and reading and writing where you're like, okay, I've written a bunch and that makes me feel really good. And then I'm like, oh, I just need to read a book. Yeah. I find writing really cerebral. I, that's why I'm not as, uh, an, uh, I'm not as passionate about my writing uh, art as I am about like improv and, in, and writing through improv because then I'm on my feet and I'm not thinking I'm actually just mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. existing in the moment <laughs> it's hot I mean it's also so isolated which I don't like I mean you I think oh, you right. might like it because of your I do yeah <laughs> it's, the only, it's the only reason I started writing was that I was like what job could I have I mean I've been writing my whole life but yeah. mostly like plays and short stories and more like narrative book stuff um but I also don't like it like I and I also don't buy when people are like I I love writing I'm like fuck off Hemingway the only time just like the idea that like I just sit down and make coffee and play music I was like are you kidding me it's like not it's torture it's like I'm pacing through my apartment I'm drenched in sweat I'm 
but it's a muscle. It's a muscle. I know that if I did, if I wrote as much as I improvised, I would get better at that and I wouldn't hate it as much. I also find that writing for film is a particularly confining, uh, because it, because what a film, what a film is, is a, it, the script is a production draft where me coming from like a literary background, it really matters to me, <laughs> the eloquence of the writing. And, and when I read, you know, like Elena Ferrante, I'm reading it and going oh, like, oh God, I reread sentences and, and, it, and it triggers and it, it illuminates. And it's just the way she formulates sentences. Like that's what literature is to mm -hmm. me. Like writing is that to me is reading and, and books and, and plays and stuff like that. So when I try and must take that muscle and muscle it into a production draft where it's like cut to blah, 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 blah. I fucking hate that yeah. shit. Um, and my producer brain can't stop thinking about like how much this would be or how expensive this right. would be and blah, blah, blah. But um, uh, I find the only type of writing I like to do is writing that has absolutely no uh, function beyond just the writing. As in like, I'm not planning on showing it to anyone or pitching it mm -hmm. or talking about it out loud. The only writing I like is that where I'm just like, this is for me and my imagination. And I'm just like, la di da. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I just, when people are, I love writing. It's so romantic. I'm like, fuck off. Like, <laughs> just absolute, like that's fake news to me. I just can't. <laughs> and was this always your destiny? Like, do you feel like um, destiny? I don't know if that's the right word, but like when you were a kid, were you producing as a kid? And then you just got older and just produced things that were bigger? Than just your backyard that's a very good question um <clears throat> well uh i mean i, I know like you grew up in like a seven years old baron I... von munchauser type of environment <laughs> i understand that your your life was in this odd and beautiful magical yeah i mean we lived in the city some you know half, most of the year so it's like i lived a pretty like normal vancouver -y life but i when i was younger i my mom there was okay i was in class i was in grade like two or something and we were doing an assignment on uh if you had a if you could have a magical power if you could have a superpower what would it be and why and i had like the pen hovering over the paper so excited to write down breathe underwater because breathing underwater to me swimming underwater like I was a synchronized swimmer I am obsessed with the ocean the ocean is like my absolute full heart all of it mm -hmm. I was like this is what I want but of course in like a seven-year-old brain where you feel like you still have magic and that you know your words and how you write your name in the top right of a paper is like triggers some sort of la di da and like you're watching Matilda and so you just think I'm going to write it down. It is possible. It is possible. So in the, I really, really wanted to do this. I really wanted to write that down. But with, in the fear that if I wrote, whatever I write down will probably come true. I, um, instead of writing down what I wanted, I wrote down, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to hate this. I wrote down what I needed, which was to not be able to sleep so I can get more work done. So. Yeah. So my mom was like brought into the school and they're like, is Kelly okay? Like she said, all these other students are like fly and like firebomb and like, you know, be able to go invisible. And she's just like to not have to sleep so she can get more work done. Like what the hell? So my mom was like, um, like, what is she okay? Like, what is she doing? And my mom was like a single parent of four kids. So she's like, uh, well, I used to go to bed and like for Christmas once from Santa, I got a desk full of arts and crafts and it was like the greatest mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And I would, so I would go to bed and then I would pretend to go to bed and then I would wake up and just like sit at my desk yeah. and like, well, I had crafts, I had beads, I had a bead business. I had, I had a box in the, my high school in the office because I was the, I was on student council. I was were. like the editor of the high school yearbook. I did the PA announcements every morning. And I would get phone calls in class where the teacher would be like, Kelly, the, this is actually for you. Because like, you know, um, uh, friggin' um, like uh, sponsors for the yearbook would like call, like Pepsi right. would not, or, or the Chevron from yeah. like down the street would call. And so I had a box in the office in, in my high school for like, it was like all the teachers, the principals, the vice principals, and then me, because I was getting mail yes. at the school. And so, oh you know, but before that, when I was younger, I was always like, 
you know, putting on plays and making costumes and making art and crafts. And like, I, that's why when someone's like, what, you know, do you consider yourself more a director or a writer or an mm -hmm. actor? Or, I'm like, I'm just an artist who loves yeah. art and crafts. And that's just, if I could just um, produce and not in the film producing way, in like the create, if I could just create stuff in different mediums and platforms and things and, you know, different things. And I, and I would, so I've been doing it since I was very young, but uh, yeah, my mom was like, I don't know what she does. Oh my gosh. Can I share, my father passed away recently in December. And one of the things just to in line with our DNA that we all obviously share, he was on his last days and uh, he was still lucid. And so I got these great, awesome, fucking awesome moments with him where he would just speak so clearly. And he said, he looked at me at one point, he just shook his head. He's like, I just had the thought that I can't wait till this is over so I can get back to it. Like get back to work. Like he wants wow. to die so he can get back to work. Wow. Like he was so impatient. And he was like, and he said, I'm really impatient with this process. So wow. he had so much work to, and he loved, like he was a chemist. He loved his work. So it's a, in line with the same sort of like childhood superpower of not needing to sleep. Yeah. That's wow. Wild. That's yeah. I mean, it's, inc it's incredible when um, your need to create or you need to work or you need to like make stuff extends beyond like the human realm yeah. of like his idea of, reincarnation perhaps could have been I have a desk waiting for me <laughs> I mean I believe I so this is the 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 way I've been changing my thinking is that I do believe in the afterlife because it why not like it can exist or it can't exist so I'm going to choose that it does exist so I get a chance to see my folks yeah. again and yeah I don't know I do I have a vision that my father's probably got a blackboard somewhere that he's like <laughs> they've just taken a break from road hockey and now they're back to drawing formulas on a blackboard yeah, yeah, I believe it. I mean, I recently, you know, dealing with grief and, and losing someone, it, it, you sort of, I feel very privileged that I had never had to like think of these things before, like think being like, okay, well, where are they? What is my thing? And I take a lot of comfort in the, while well, I've manifested every other destiny I've wanted. So why can't I manifest that this is real for me and therefore true? And that, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, in the, in the, in the idea of convincing myself that I had magic when I was young, I do feel sometimes that there is that you can connect with that magic yeah. and you have that sort of thing. So yeah, I believe he's definitely at a depth. Um, now, and was this always like, was there ever any, ever a time? Cause like the process, the journey of an artist, I don't think is linear. Was there ever a time that you're like, this is hard. I'm not getting the breaks I need to keep pursuing this. I'm going to, I don't know. I'm going to do something else. Was there ever that time? Yeah, there was a time where I was like, this is not, I can't, I can't make this work. Um, and I, that's when I started writing for film. That's when I was like, okay, well, I'm auditioning for parts that are not only not, that I'm not only not booking, but are, mm -hmm. I'm so sick and tired of how offensive they are, how sexist they are, how unreal, like how I couldn't, I couldn't, I, uninspiring and, I couldn't crack the leading lady thing. It, it wasn't, it's not in my body. I, I don't know. And I was so emotionally strung out on like trying to be this thing that I was told through opera and through musical theater and through film. Um, so that's what I started writing where I was like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to try and write characters and parts for myself and make stuff. And, and then when I wrote my first film, uh, play the film with a bunch of friends, um, it did really well. And then it was like, I guess I'm a filmmaker now. Yeah. And then now it's been five years of me doing that. And nothing, nothing happened in my film career until I started making my own work. Like yeah. end of story, like nothing, nothing. And still I started like dressing like myself, being myself, trying to live more, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly private person, but like live more authentically. And then it was suddenly like, okay, things started clicking and, mm -hmm. you know, but. Was that conscious, that step? It was conscious in that I had, I got to a point where I couldn't do it anymore. Like I was like, it was conscious in the way that when you've given up, you're on the floor and you're sobbing and it's fire and you're yeah. bloody and you're glad. Like, I guess that was, it was a consciousness to my absolute breakdown. Yeah, and it was a, it was something I never, and, and now you like sort of, you know, presentations of gender and sexuality and, and you know the expectation that I don't have to be this like particular silhouette of a woman right. um the, miraculously the industry and the world has somehow 
readjusted and is catching up and suddenly welcoming that. So it's just been funny to sort of, but I feel like when I started trying to present a little more authentically a couple, like five or six years ago, it was definitely a gamble and it definitely, it was hard. It was like, all right, things I'm going to say no to things I won't do and, and all that. But, um, yeah. But that balance must have also been challenging because you, I feel like you have such a, an artistic vision of your art, like looking at something like Sugar Daddy, that's not just a film, that's like a piece of art through like the direction and the costumes and your words and your vision. Um, and then you've got that next to Letter Kenny and Killjoys and A League of Our Own, which are all like, you know, quote unquote commercial. Yeah. So how do you how do you find the you in those projects? I mean, my vision of myself in the future is like I would like to be like, you know, Tarkovsky and shoot films in that make maybe sense to me, but maybe not sense to everyone all over the world and live in the south of England in like a house and and just like make nature based films that have like a very arts and crafts like meta theatrical nature to it and and only uh any of the more commercial work though you know like like you it's I feel like I'm a character actor and I feel not not that you're a character actor. I I feel like you I like I like a large range and I I like um there's things I love in comedy of course and and but you know how do you find yourself in more commercial parts uh that might not be like the the distinct vision of how you see your art mm -hmm. I mean they're all little tweaks and fights and conversations and I say fights lovingly but like you know when I get to the costume fitting and it's like okay how do I how do I just be like cool what if we made this character a little more like masculine or what if she doesn't wear a tight belt around her waist and she wears little oversized clothes or whatever and and not and to be honest I I don't have an interest in playing myself I I don't know what that is I mean a lot of people when sugar daddy came out were like how are you like Darren I was like well not at all like why would I we look the same <laughs> she had I'm in the same skin sack yeah. her, but she's not her and I are not the same person but you know I'm I want to be other people I want to be like an artistic character actor gremlin who like be is different people and, and so whatever serves the part is what I want to go to but I will say it's, it's not about me in the costume fitting or talking to the director or fighting for certain things to make it like myself. But what I do try and fight for is to make it like a portrayal of a female or a non-binary person or a man, even when I've played men, um, what, that is, is, not what, is not falling into stereotypes that make my skin crawl. So in that way, it's like making it more authentic to me, but it's, um, I desperately want to play a desperate housewife with like fake nails, all of it. Do you? Oh yeah, oh, fuck yeah. I mean, why not? I think I, I'd be in the nail fitting going, oof. It, basically I have two um, pretty loose, but not loose as in like, no, they're, they're pretty intense. They're pretty like foundational. I have two like hypothesis for like what I will do and what I'll say yes to. Um, one, is it, if it's the most opposite of what I've just done, mm -hmm. like the most polar opposite of what I've just done. So if, if what I've just done is I've produced and made a film or da, 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 then I want to like go do a, you know, I want to be like in the choir of an experimental opera in Berlin and paid, be paid nothing. Like that's like, mm -hmm. I just want it to be the most opposite of what I've done. And if it scares the shit out of me, I will say yes. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't scare me, I will say no. And the only exception of that is if a friend calls me and is like, yo, can you be in my thing? And, and you know, with the exception of the artistic barter of the community, where mm -hmm. if someone's like, listen, I want you to be in this thing and I want you to play the exact same character you play on Letterkenny, I'll be like, absolutely. You yeah, know, right. I'm not scared of it and it's not opposite, but because I rely, we all rely on friends saying yes to stuff and, and uh, all that. Mm -hmm. But if it, so... So yeah, I mean, what would scare me right now would be playing a, like a housewife. I mean, that would be terrifying. Yeah, you're right. It would be terrifying for different reasons, but uh, yeah. Like full on. I mean, I have a project where I've sort of written myself in to play that. So it will, it will come to fruition at one point. It's so funny because now I don't ever wear, like not, there's not much going on with makeup wise, which is so funny because years ago, and I won't say who, but like only five years ago, I, tr I was on set trying to advocate for the fact that my character 
didn't wear mascara <laughs> and yeah. it was a fucking thing oh. <laughs> it was yeah crazy and that was only five years ago I mean that was all and I was like okay and they're like well you know we we do have to put liner on you because we have to like you know make sure that we see your eyeballs right. and that it is you know, we gotta, we gotta do that. And I was like, just straight up, no, like, whatever yeah. they're doing, guys, put it on my face and I'm going to go out. So, so, I mean, I'm looking, looking at your IMDb. I think one of your first credits was like spa girl from off center television series in 2006. So then I kind of flash forward to your sugar daddy. And also like, you know, you're starring in league of league of their own, which is, that's a huge commercial film how are you or a tv series how are you feeling about the transition between the kelly mccormick that did spa girl 2006 to this <laughs> how does that sit in your brain like league of their own is uh, one of those like dream come true roles that i'm still like looking up for like an anvil like just to be like this isn't this isn't gonna happen you shot and, it like, already so don't you if the anvil comes well no, no no we shot the pilot we shoot the series in in like a month i go to la in like a few weeks to go do to do baseball training again but um yeah league of their own i mean if you look at my mdb and my resume it's like the characters i played in in theater and in opera their all names are like betty kim lindsay kelly cindy blah and then they start slowly turning into colby <laughs> darren like sid blah, blah. and you can just see the transition of when i started sort of showing myself and advocating for myself in a way that felt more authentic but hell like some of those very feminine roles are very like <laughs> in the beginning but um how am I transitioning uh well I mean the cast is insane the the obviously the material is iconic and I get to play a scrappy scrappy farm boy from Moose Jaw Saskatchewan who is like, you know, doesn't know how to be around a large group of people and is like, likes to start fights and is, you know, sort of a, um, like someone struggling with gender and their sexuality and all this stuff. So it's like, it, it feels, and, and, and to do so at a high level, to do so at such a, like with such a big company like Amazon mm -hmm. and production company. Yeah, it feels, it feels very exciting and um I, I think what how i've arranged it in my brain is that it's going to afford me a lot of opportunity and a lot of a platform and, and a lot of at least financial stability so that i can work on my side project but my a project which is my own filmmaking mm -hmm. so um i feel very lucky in that way uh i was told by my agent once that um like you he's like i firmly believe that rich kaplan who's just the most wonderful person on the planet he said i firmly believe that an actor will get to the level that they are meant to get at and that like if and i and i do he's like it's, you can only control how hard you work and i do believe that um I, i'm in control of how people see me now and mm. how people frame me and brand me or whatever the friggin name the word is but I'm in control of that now because because of the filmmaking and because of the writing and that mm. has been a very surprising I mean byproduct of starting to write which I didn't that's not the reason I went into I guess maybe that's kind of the subconscious reason I went into it but I just sort of feel like y'all don't even know me mm. yet <laughs> you yeah. know like I don't give a fuck if I'm here 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 I I I I I'm the kind of person where I don't talk about what I'm writing and what I'm working on. I try and like keep it to myself because I find the energy of talking about it out loud is sort of dilutes and stay like makes stale the energy that I need to like get it on the page. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. I don't know if I I I worry less about the perception. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Like, how do you feel about jumping around stuff like that? Um, I, I mean, I kind of live for it. I live for the diversity in my career because it keeps my my brain, uh, I don't know, worked out. Like, I feel like everything exercises different muscles. But if I'm doing like a sketch show, that's going to exercise my muscles for if I'm going to do a live show or all the mm -hmm. different things. They're, they're all sort of part and parcel for me. But um, But I definitely feel different about like, and I think I'm getting better at this, but the like the outside versus the inside. So something like a big show on Amazon, I think I would wrestle with being like presenting as opposed to going from inside out. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, all I know is that I get that. And I think that if I 
I'm so, I mean, I wanted it so bad in my early twenties. I wanted it, mm -hmm. but I'm so fucking thankful that I had zero success. I mean, I didn't have zero success. I had lots of success in the theater industry, but zero success in the film industry earlier on because I, if I had booked something like this earlier on, my career would go, right. it would just fizzle because I don't, I didn't have the ability to advocate for myself and be like, I know this is what is on the page. Can we just yes. push a little further? Yeah. I know that you've written this and da, 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 or I know this is what you're thinking, but can we add this layer? Like what I can, you know, I know the conditions in which you I know yourself to more. Yeah. I know myself yeah. more and I know the conditions and the things I need and, and, and the, the, the level of work and collaboration that I like expect and want and, and push for uh, that will create an experience for myself and a character that I can play that I can get my head into and understand um, because there's just you know earlier in your career when you're when you're given this stuff you, you sort of just fly by the seat of your pants and then there's so many instances where I was like I don't like what I did because I know I didn't understand it mm. and so you know all that but yeah. It's a, uh, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be a different thing. But do you get nervous about this kind of stuff? I I used to. Now I sort of, I feel like I'm in a good place. Well, well this was one of those, you know, those like those times where you get auditions for stuff and you're, first of all, I get nervous for set. Like I get nervous to get on stage. Like mm -hmm. that, there's that's never going away from me. <laughs> there's never there's never like I'm never gonna be so chill. Right. I'm like yeah. Like, like just eating a sandwich before a take. Like, no, I'm there like ready, like ready to go. Like, ugh, like I'm not, um, yeah. at all times, I think it's going to be taken away from me and they're going to be like, oh, we made a mistake. You know, my fraud yeah. syndrome and my self-doubt is like quite at a peak level at all times. So um, I stay on it. Um, but this part for League of Their Own was one of two times in my life where I read I had the privilege of reading a breakdown and I looked at it and I was like, well, who else are they gonna fucking hire? Like, come on. <laughs> and that never happens to me because I'm constantly in a state of like, oh, what do they want? Like, mm -hmm. ah, like you know, I've just only recently stopped giving a fuck and be, like stop reading breakdowns and just being like, I don't care what they want. I'm gonna give them what I think that this could be, you know, mm -hmm. I don't, and, and trying to, and dropping the whole, like, well, I'm re you know, it's like we, as actors, we do like close readings of the breakdowns. It says here that she's really tough, but then it says down here, she's sort of like sensitive. So then we need to, and it's, and like, and all this crap that you use, that I used to do, I don't do it anymore. Cause I'm like, you know, I, I feel I'm like, no, no, I think I get this. I'll find my way in. And if that's the way they want it, then that will be great. And if that's not how they want it, then then it, you know, yeah. I hope we find who they want. Yeah. Um, so was there a process that you went through for that audition or was it just like, I'm just going to bring me? Uh, it was a long process. It yeah. was like a six months, six months wow. of flying to LA back and forth. Yeah, it was. And I was sort of trying to figure out if I was going to move there as, as you know, and, um, it was a lot, uh, but <laughs> I still had this like crazy thought, it, you know, it, it feels, I feel from the outside, I think it feels like it felt like to my mom and to other people, like this is a big break, mm -hmm. which it, it does feel like that. But as we talked about earlier, some of the chess pieces and things that I played 10 years ago and five years ago that I was sort of positioning and dealing with alone in my room with no validation and no, um, no permission has, I know, has led me to this moment. It feels like I was walking through a door I opened many years ago and I walked through it and, and that has been, and that was why it was so rewarding to, to book it was that it was like, I put myself here mm. and I did it and I did it. That door was opened at a time when, when it was really painful to open it. And that, it, and that has felt very good where it just felt like I breezed in. Like that audition room was just like, hey guys, I'm here. Mm -hmm. What's up? Mm -hmm. Like, it was not, it was not that same sort of, I need to break down the door and I need to, you know, show them who I am because they don't know. It was, I was meeting a bunch of people like Abby Jacobson and Darcy Carden and Will Graham and all these people and Jamie Babbitt were in the room. And I, it really felt like I was, 
I was like, I'm here now. So here we are. And, and, <laughs> yeah. I, and that is never like for someone who struggles with fraud syndrome and, and self-doubt, um, which I know a lot of artists do that, that has never, that's only other, ha- that's that feeling has only ever happened once <laughs> was Killjoys. Killjoys was, I, I read that part and I, and I went to Jason Knight and I walked in the room and I, I <laughs> made some weird ass choices. I was just like, I feel like I get this character in a way probably no one is getting or that maybe it's it's not on the page, but there was something about her. There was some sort of electricity that Mm -hmm. I was like, this isn't in the page yet, but I'm going to, I know this. And so I just, you know, walked in the room and, and I was like, I, I only, I can do this. And that was, you know, so Mm -hmm. it was nice to have, but that again, it makes me sound like super confident that these, these experiences are so far between. <laughs> Most of the time I'm sitting there being like, how do I? Yeah, I sometimes, I look at roles and then I might look at it and be like, oh no, this is me. But then I, I'm really good at talking myself out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll start with like, this is me. I'll just walk into the room and just be like, this is sneakers. And then by the yeah. time I actually walk into the room, I'll be like, I have five other people that you should probably see for this role. <laughs> Let me give you their phone have, have you ever seen your name in a breakdown? A bunch of times. Yeah, I've not booked those ones. I know, me too. If they're looking for a Naomi Sneakers type, don't get it. Because they don't want this one. They want one adjacent. They want, they want, what they want is a facsimile of what they think you are, the perception. As you know, there's no truth in that. It's like the, because, you know, and, and I'm wary of it because oftentimes now, like I'll get, you know, I've talked to my, my, my team about this and they're super supportive, but sometimes I'll get auditions for stuff where they're like, you know, like a, like a hat, a ball cap wearing androgynous lesbian who's like, doesn't give a fuck and blah, blah, blah. And I, and, and I will tell them, I was like, I get scared because I'm like, well, I don't want to be pigeonholed just because I'm suddenly, you know, living more authentically. But it, it's, it's interesting sometimes to 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 sort of step outside yourself and be like oh that's how I'm being perceived right yeah, now and right. that's what's happening to me little do they know that I'm like literally like trying to play a desperate housewife but that's part of it right like that that's the part of it that you are a baseball wearing desperate housewife like it is the <laughs> journey of like tearing away all the different pieces of armor that we've put on over the years to protect ourselves from the pain of rejection and going yeah. actually this is who I am and recognizing like this this is this woman that you know she's probably spilt food on her on her top and she probably shouldn't buy a nice top because of that but she's also super confident sometimes like it's everything Mm -hmm. it's just a matter of how do you reveal that I think that's the uh, Jodie Foster Mm -hmm. somebody's talking about Jodie Foster saying in her speech they were like talking about her coming out and and she was like well you've seen my films you know who I am yeah yeah and and it to be honest, it's it's been a a learning process um, with the with Sugar Daddy coming out because first of all, Sugar Daddy comes out and all of the Canadian film scene, like all the people who do coverage, the journalists, the interviewers, the all of them, such incredible people who just want to support Canadian film and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, I. <laughs> had done like a bunch of interviews. And, and again, I'm so happy because as much as more people can see that film, then it, I, you know, I, I wanted to tell a feminist story. So it was with the express interest in changing minds and young minds and all that stuff. So I want more people to see it, but, um, I was having a lot of anxiety because I was realizing that I was talking about the project. People were asking me, Oh, where, you know, where did it come from? Why'd you write it? What's personal, blah, blah. And I started having daily panic attacks because, uh, and I read like a a quote from, I won't steal this quote and pretend like I I came up with it, but um, David Lynch was like, he said something like, you know, you make a thing and you make a piece of art and then people ask you about it and they want you to explain it. And I feel like he says, I feel like it's a crime because he's like, the reason I made it was because I couldn't say it Mm. because I couldn't put it in English. So I put it in this format and a lot of myself and my body and my my whole lived experience is in a way on the in the film in everything i make and i did it because i could work through those feelings in that format and not work through them out loud yep. so i would be in an interview and i would hear myself 
talking about the film and talking about the project and and being like that it it's not but that's not right I don't I, I so I it was a big learning experience I, I would hope I want to get to a place where and I'm not there and I obviously like promotion is an important and hard working and intensely um, valuable part of the filmmaking process but I'd like to get to a point where I can say like it's in there like I as you said I, everything you want to know it's in the film mm -hmm. like I how it comes from my body where it came from I answer those questions in the format I needed to what more do you want from me you know like I don't know how to and so yeah like the idea that anyone would need to ask me about my personal life. I'm like, are you crazy? Like, I just made the most exposing right. film. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and, you know, and, and, but I think people, it's not autobiographical. Like I didn't, I'm not doing, none of the things that happened in the film happened to me, but it's like allegorical and right. metaphorical and all that stuff. And, and who I am, I think is quite obvious to people, <laughs> but you know, yeah. it's, it's an interesting yeah, so that that Jodie yeah. Foster idea of like her needed to come out. She's like, "Have you seen me?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think people just sometimes need to be like spoon fed, right? So that the end be like, "Yes, this is what the actual." Do you know what these are the words I actually said in the circumstance where you're like, just do a little bit of work. Yeah, exactly. Absorb yeah. it, and yeah. I mean, we're definitely in a period where, for 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 better mostly, but also a little bit for worse. It, that where we're really, 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 really into like identifying language and labels right. and things. And, and all of that is very important, but I feel like there's a, um, it, it's, it's sort of like a double-edged sword because we're asking people to be more forthright about their personal life. Yeah. And as an artist, I'm so vigilant, like talk about like hypotheses and, and conditions in which I need to create, like, because my personal, my life, my body, and, and my art are quite one and the same, the silence and solitude that I need to create is extends to me keeping things quiet, you know, so. But who's to say that? Like, you know, I think it is a really interesting time. And as you said, with um, people expressing how they identify because from some perspectives, it's from a point of supporting that. So asking sure. somebody like, how do you identify is just a way of like, how do I make you feel the most welcome that I can? Well, also, I just hope we're in a point where someone could be like, and my, my, my answer is, I don't know yet. Yeah. Like, like, are, are we at a place where we, uh, I work really well in chaos. I love the space between. Yeah. I love, like the best quote I ever heard about, we were talking about like the afterlife, which, um, which I think this is like the most beautiful or the presence of a supreme personal being or something like that. Mm -hmm. The best quote I ever heard, which I applied to my artistic life is, um, I know there's not something out there, but I know there's not nothing. But can't, can't we just not know? Like, I think I'm okay with not knowing. Like, I, I think that, yeah, the more that we can have discussions where, you know, and I've had these before, where somebody says a statement that is so shocking or so offensive that I have to take a step back and say, I don't know how to deal with this right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's also, it makes sense to me because you're an artist and you live a very mobile, like unformulated, unstable existence where you don't know where you're gonna be, blah, blah, blah. So the sort of, and I, I don't, I think from the outside people sort of go, oh, like you, but, but what we're what we want is to work on the Amazon show da, 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 so that we can get towards stability. Not at all. I want. I'm not on the search for a, a, a bigger career so I can have more stability. I I am adverse to to being comfortable and being stable. Like I I want it to be. I want to live in more places. I want it to be <laughs> right. more unstable. Um, but you know the sort of more chaos elsewhere and have less things because I'm not like, okay, now I got to figure out, you know, A, B, and C. Um, but that sort of, there's not something, but there's not nothing. That kind of, I don't know, is how I have to keep my life in that position, in that yeah. sense of chaos, in that sense of question and exploration. And if I put too many words to certain things, like how I identify or, or what, all those things for me at least it i mean why any why i write anything is because i i am overwhelmed with some sort of unspeakable feeling 
some sort of intangible like affliction and then I wrestle it to ground with words. And then when you wrestle it to the ground with words, you're like, I did it. It's a dead carcass now. Okay, go have your funeral. Bye-bye. <laughs> and that's sort of how I feel about <laughs> it. sounds terrible. No, but like, that's it's a good image. About. Yeah, and it's, and, it, and it's actually one of, I was talking with um, Marie Helene Delorme, who wrote the music for Sugar Daddy. She, uh, I had emotionally prepared myself for the fact that when this film came out after five years of working, that I wouldn't be able to, experience you know the theater um live experience exhibition of it with people in a room because coming from theater that's all I care about is I want to feel people's response like you know being on stage yeah. your, your whole body is home to knowing what's yes. happening with the audience and that is like that is why you get such a high on being on stage and so I really just wanted to watch you know be in the theater watch people watch it and then feel on stage what what the responses were get people to argue with me and the talk back and like, you know, give me crazy questions and all that stuff. But we were, I thought I had emotionally prepared for it. And then when it, when it came, when it was all happening online and, and, you know, I'm sort of averse to my computer and I hate my phone and I don't like social media that much. So I was like, okay, this film is happening basically online. Here we are. Um, she and I were texting back and forth and, and I was like, you know, I'll never for the rest of my life shit on the ritual of festivals and parties and red carpets and stuff which obviously as an actor you're supposed to be a little mm -hmm. cynical about because it comes in the public perception of like networking and all the stuff I need a ritual a live ritual and I said to her I was like not even to celebrate this process not even to be like it's here it's the end of it and she said she's like yeah you need a funeral you need a very ceremonial beautiful fun with alcohol funeral and I started thinking I was like that's what it is it's like the film coming out and mm. people being able to see it for everyone else it's the beginning of their exposure to the project for me it's I need that funeral so that I can move on to something else mm. I need that ceremony of people saw it it happened in real time I was there and then I can go okay guys I'm done I'm moving on to something else and not having that has I think maybe like it was not the most pleasant experience, but you know, mm -hmm. people were watching it online and people are finding movies. And so I'm really thankful. And obviously there are so many films that were put on ice because of COVID. Yeah. So I wake up in the middle of the night being like, oh my God, fuck, it's in the can. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. So um, yeah, just thinking of that as a, as a ceremony of funeral is sort of like an affectionate way of putting it. I don't know. Uh, like little background. I remember seeing it for the first time in um, Delicate, to see a, mm. a fringe with uh, Kat Sandler's play and being like, who, like, who is this person that just set this stage on fire? Like, it was so exciting. And that it was so, fun. yeah, but it was, it was just like, I don't know. It was just so my jam to see somebody care about their performance that as much as I watched you care. And, um, and then when we started this podcast, I was like, I got to get Kelly to chat. Cause I just knew, I knew there would be like, pew, pew. And, um, and then you and I had coffee in Los Angeles and talked like this. And I went, well, that was the chat. I should have recorded yeah. it. <laughs> so I, I kind of pushed myself. So now months and months later, we've had this. And honestly, I'm so grateful for it. And I'm so, um, I'm so charged by your, your artistic vision of things. It's really amazing. <laughs> Truly. I'm happy. I, I, every time we talk, I'm like, we just delve into such effortless um, personal spaces, but feeling in like a, like, it just feels, you know, I feel, I feel so, I feel, you mentioned this when, when you were doing the um, intro for Sugar Day at the CFF, you were like, it's so interesting how, like at these major junctures of our like careers yeah. or whatever, we sort yeah. of find each other and like, it'll be a couple months and then we'll be like at some sort of thing. And, and you're just about to go and do like baseball training for this show. I can't wait till till our next juncture. Like, um, well, hopefully you're back, you know, in LA at one point, or yeah, or maybe I'll be back in Vancouver, and we'll be. You know, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm going to wrap it up. I always turn the tables and uh, mm -hmm. ask if you have a question for me because I feel like it's not fair otherwise. Um, okay, I have a good question. I thought about this last night while okay. watching a bunch of seals on the ocean. What about? the career or the artistic life. I don't use like using the career that much, but artistic, what about your artistic life? What aspect of it that you have now that you're really proud of, but when you were really young, 
dreaming up an artistic life, you did not anticipate, you didn't even, it didn't even have a glimmer of, of reality in your head, but you, it's something you do now that you're like, wow, I'm really proud of. And this is, um, was unexpected. I didn't think I would go into this. And on the flip side, what did you dream up when you were younger about your artistic life um, that you have disconnected with now, or you don't have now that you would like to reconnect with? What, right. what facet of an artistic life when you were like a child, you were dreaming up, do you not have now? Yeah. That's such a fantastic. I think, um, I think I, I am the most proud of pulling people together. I think, and when you talk about like, we, you know, it's funny that you should even ask this because it's something I was thinking about that I didn't bring up. But when you talk about like why we do bigger projects or why we want to do an Amazon show, it's because if I tell a joke to my husband and it gets a good reaction, I'm like, okay, but wouldn't it be great if I could tell it to a bigger audience? So it gives you the ability of sharing what you know is like, like one of my superpowers. I have a superpower, which is joke telling and, and comedy. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, that's, it's the thing I'm most proud of that I have the ability to pull people together. Uh, mm -hmm. I, we have a show, I don't know if you ever saw the show we used to do in, in uh, Kensington Market called the Carnegie Hall Show. And mm -hmm. it went through this transition. We did it for three years every week, rain, blizzard, everything, Oscar night, everything. And there were nights that nobody would turn up. There'd be three people in the audience and I would know all of them by their first name. And <laughs> we would just that. be like, what are we doing? Let's, this isn't working. We're, and we'd push through, we pushed through. And there was a moment where it turned and I looked in the audience and it was sold out and it was a bunch of strangers. And I was like, this is because we've created something that is worthy of bringing people together. And easily that's what I'm most proud of. Same with the firecracker department. There, we're mm. creating places where people uh, feel safe to create and feel safe to voice their opinions and um, are, are challenged to take creative action, which I think is important. Mm. Um, mm. Second part to that is. Or, or just that, like what facet of your artistic life did you dream up when you were younger that has not been realized yet or you want to reconnect with or because I find like sometimes when I don't know when I'm lost when I've lost my way or I'm unsure of like what you know it's like that thing that you haven't done yet that still maybe soaks your decision making now yeah that's a great that's also a great question being as we're at these crossroads that I think people find themselves especially at the end hopefully of the pandemic where they're like and now what <laughs> Um, yeah. And I think our dreams change. Like when I was first started, like, I just, I want to, I want to be on Broadway musicals. And then I was like, no, nope, that doesn't, I don't want to be a dancer anymore. I danced for a long time in my childhood. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I want to be at, at Stratford. And then I went and saw some shows at Stratford. And I went, oh, my dream has changed. That's not really what I want anymore. Yeah. Sat, uh, Second City was my dream for a while. And I felt like I realized that. And so now I feel like I want to put all the things that I've learned in my career into my own show that's the that's mm -hmm. the ideal for me because i feel like i've been gathering these floating beautiful balloons of creativity and people and putting them into a project mm -hmm. would be that, mm -hmm. that dream yeah i that's gonna happen i'm gonna wrap it up with some firecracker wrap-up questions here we go fill in the blank a firecracker is uh an uncompromising complicated person who navigates the world as being treated like a woman. I knew, I knew that answer was going to kill it. What do you want to be best known for? Oh my God. Uh, what are we best known for? Um, making decisions that no one anticipated. Can I tell you also that I think you might be one of the best gut listeners. Like, I feel like you listen to your gut a lot. <laughs> I do. That's why I live in a lot of silence and solitude. So I <laughs> So I can I hear, it. hear it. If this, if your life was a movie, this is a like the final scene to your movie. Not that you're dying or anything crazy like that, but what was like a turning point in your life that was uh, that changed your path? Oh my god! Uh, being having like a horrific personal like uh, like excavation, not breakup, but like having no, like getting to a point in my career where I was like completely, mm -hmm. I'm being sort of vague, but like completely rock bottom <laughs> to the point of like, you know, I, I, I don't have any, I have no, maybe my, my electricity getting turned off was probably. <laughs> I mean, that's going to give you a sign a hundred percent. If you're getting your electricity from the hallway, 
<laughs> Living like a Victorian man. <laughs> yeah. What's what is something that people don't know about you? Uh, that I go, I swim almost every day. I, I will swim in any body of water at any time, at any time of year. Um, Do you feel like you'll never, I, this is something I've come to terms with. I don't know if I'll ever be able to live without seeing the water every day. Yeah. I mean, that's moving to, moving to Toronto. I didn't know Toronto was in front of a lake until a year after living there. <laughs> Cause I grew up in Vancouver and I was like, Toronto, the big smoke and like, no, like the, the concrete jungle. I didn't know that there was water there. Um, but yeah, living, the ocean is a constant, I mean, it, it's sort of cliche, but it's a constant form of, like I can just stare at it and my anxiety tempers out a bit. Um, but yeah, the, the ocean and nature. I mean, I think people can tell this from my Instagram. I uh, spit, a spit, like essentially just stare at nature all day and take photos of it and <laughs> just waiting for National Geographic <laughs> to call me. What has been your favorite mistake so far? Oh, I love this question. Um, I think my biggest mistake was trying to be a leading lady. That was my biggest mistake. Trying to fit myself into that mold every time I failed I failed because of that and every time I won was when I out of anger revolted against it so my biggest mistake was like trying to be what I was told I was what I was told was my capital from a very young age you know being an ingenue (laughs) failing at an ingenue greatest mistake um what is something that you haven't done yet but you know you have to do uh move to England is the mm. is the is the one that's still on the docket it's been on the docket since I was like five but London or like Lake District <laughs> it's basically like move to the south of England uh and live in like a little cabin there that would be yeah. relocate to to the UK is is still the thing I mean I, I go there a lot I go there when I can but that would be the thing that is like you know yeah oh and swim the English channel or something crazy like oh yeah yeah just throw that in yeah. for sure <laughs> <laughs> Um, and just tilting the spotlight to another firecracker. Do you have somebody you want to do a shout out? Uh, there is one person who is an actor, director, writer, creator, person, mentor, who, like, I don't know how to say this without sounding like hyperbolic, but she quite literally keeps me alive. And that's Allegra Fulton. I feel I love Allegra Fulton. She, she, uh, she changed my life with those performances early on with like Frida Kahlo. She just like... You know, when you feel like you have all the answers and you're like, I don't want to bother someone with nope. my upset, you know, no, or like when you're, you know, you, you've been given the tools from your therapist or from a, a writer, or you, when you find yourself at a junction and you're like, okay, I can like figure this out, this anxiety, this fear, whatever. It's like, I will call her sometimes when I feel like I know how to handle a situation. And then she will give me words that crack open on another dimension of what it means to survive and and what like I I don't know how she quite literally keeps me alive and I Mm. I look to her she's so smart and even just the sound of her voice is the most like (laughs) like comforting thing like her she's Mm -hmm. got I mean she she had a huge she still has a huge voice of her career for a reason (laughs) her voice just like crackles with depth and wisdom but um her work, her words, her, mm-hmm. her whole, like, I sometimes feel like my phone has this power where I can just call her up and somehow I'm talking like a fucking Oracle. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, mm-hmm. she would be my, our, and our origin story is very, very funny. Um, and very interesting, which I'll tell you once over drinks, but, uh, she's my ultimate mentor, all of it. So love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. No, I think, uh, I remember seeing her in, when I was in theater school and watching her and going, how, how, what? how what's going on and then watching her career develop into where she is now and uh, I, know. I know and if you can ever if you ever have her on here like I would just be sitting there with popcorn because she's just one of those people yeah. where like besides her artistic career besides the the stuff she does the art she makes her mm-hmm. understanding of her own hypothesis of how to live and how to live artistically and how to navigate yourself and your career like that interface she is a genius like it's Mm -hmm. it's too much thank you that's a yeah that was a good one um what's advice advice you would have given a younger kelly well i'm very much of the sort of i like i learn a lot from failure so it's hard for me to think that i would give any of that little fucker advice (laughs) i'm sort of like sink or swim bitch that's kind of like my (laughs) 
uh, you know, anytime I've learned something, it's been from fire and falling. So um, I wouldn't even want to say like, stop trying to be a leading lady or stop trying to do all those things because it, it is only the journey of me figuring that out in real time that taught me the lesson hard enough, mm-hmm. hard enough for me to uh, internalize it. What advice would I give? Um, call your mother more. Um, stop being a bitch to your mother when she's worried about you and take get you know, investigate your, investigate your mental and physical health earlier because all the other, all the other lessons that I know I learned, I need, I need to learn the hard way. So I can't, I can't, I can't reveal those things to my younger self. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise it'll be like butterfly effect and I'll end up in the wrong body and that. <laughs> Um, thank you. I have just, I'm so charged by this discussion. I always am from chatting with you, but I think, I think the world of you, I can't wait to find out where we, our paths cross again, but I, I, I'm going to be texting you a whole bunch in the next little while just to, uh, reverberate from this, this, uh, chat. Thank you for having me. It's been a long time coming. I'm so happy. Mm, Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Bye for now. Be well, be safe. I mean, didn't you just love that chat? I really could have talked with Kelly for a hundred years and you better believe I've been keeping in touch over text and connecting as they gear up to go and shoot a league of their own. So exciting. So exciting to see that. And then knowing Kelly's in it, I'm like front row seat. Thank you very much. Now you can follow Kelly on Twitter at K-E-L McCormick and on Instagram at Kelly and Phyllis. Floyder Films is Kelly's production company, which you can find out more about at www.floiderfilms.com. The award-winning film written, starring, and produced by Kelly, Sugar Daddy, is on VOD, and you can follow its journey online at Sugar Daddy Film. Hashtag Sugar Daddy Film. Look out for news on the League of Their Own series, because I know, I know so many of us are looking forward to it, and I just know Kelly's going to just shine alongside those incredible other cast members. Oh my gosh, i got to calm down. Until that comes out, why not watch Kelly in Killjoys, or Carter, The Expanse, or Amazon and Netflix, anytime. I mean, Kelly's everywhere. Plus, don't forget, on the CBC Gem app, you can watch all the Nedos of Duquesne Island, which is a mockumentary presented as lost footage of 1970s era. It's ridiculous and funny, and Kelly's great in it. It's just very unique, and you should see it. As always, make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter at www.firecrackerdepartment.com and follow us, Firecracker D-E-P-T. Let us know what resonated for you from this conversation or share this conversation with another fellow firecracker and spread some firecracker love. And I love you. I'm just having such a great June and I'm sharing my love. uh, So I hope you're doing the same. Happy Pride, everyone. Happy June. I hope you're having a great, great, great start to the summer. Bye for now. Winnie Wong is our Firecracker head producer. Follow her at wonder underscore Wong on Instagram and wonder underscore Wong 8 on Twitter. Sydney Nielsen is our co-producer and head editor. You can follow them at Sydney underscore Nielsen. Sydney, like Australia. Nielsen, like milk. Our intro outro writer is Lauren Shell, who you can follow at underscore Lauren S-C-H-E-L-L. This episode was edited by Jordan Giddens, who you can follow at Jordan Giddens. That's Jordan with a Y. The rest of the team comes at you from Toronto, Los Angeles, Austin, London, Dubai, and truly from all over the world. Get into the full Firecracker Department core team at firecrackerdepartment.com slash about because we're always updating and we're always growing. Stay tuned to our newsletter for advanced updates on our monthly meditations, upcoming mentorship workshops, live script department readings, festival partnerships, weekly writing workouts, and dates for 2021, and so much more. There's lots going on in Firecracker Department. Now, whether you're a first time or a long time listener to the Firecracker Department, we always, always want to hear from you. We love hearing what quotes, the specifics, the nuances of things that stuck with you. We mean it. We really do. And we respond to every single thing that comes our way. If it gives your brain goosebumps or it piques your curiosity or makes you want to stop and write something down, send it back to us or our Firecracker guest or both. I mean, everybody likes to know that when they put something out into the world, that it resonates. And if it sparks something in you, use that creativity to take some creative action. Share it because it just reverberates, you know? If you see somebody being creative, that might spark somebody else's creativity. So pay it forward. Thanks also to Jeff Malutinovic and Igor Korea for our theme music. And thanks to you. Yeah, you. Sitting there, driving there, walking there, working out there, and taking time to listen. 
We know there's a lot of options out there and we really appreciate you choosing us. We hope to see you at maybe brunch, maybe the writing workshop. And until next time, thank you for listening to the Firecracker Department. We'll see you next time.